good morning, everyone. Right, good morning. Uh, just a reminder that the deadline for submission of your laboratory assignment is on Wednesday at 6 p.m. And you should be able to see the submission portal in your group homepage. If you can't see it, if it's not visible in your group homepage, please send me an email. The paper for your uh, second coursework was uploaded last week, and the deadline for that one is at 6 p.m. on 9th of December. Before I start uh, chapter 6, are there any questions? Yes, please. Didn't you tell us earlier that the part two coursework starts at the 9th of December? I said the deadline. I think I said submission deadline is that I uploaded the paper last week, and the submission deadline is on 9th of December, 6 p.m. on 9th of December. Any other questions? So I finished uh, chapters uh, one to six, five, and now we move on to chapter six. So far, when we were analyzing a structure, it was subject to one type of loading. But the majority of engineering structures during their service life are subject to a combination of loads. And a typical example that you're familiar with is the fuselage of an aircraft. During flight, at high altitude, is subject to internal pressure, subject to axial compression, bending, and a torsion. So in this chapter, we start with combined loading, the definition of combined loading. I'll give you a, an example for it, which is on slide one. And I've already covered it in one of these tutorial sessions almost 10 days ago. And then we move on to two-dimensional stress-strain analysis. And what you're doing in your laboratory assignment is based on course content of chapter six. It's relatively straightforward if you understand the concept uh, behind the equations. It's very, very easy to solve examples in chapter six. I should say it's the easiest one. It's based on the concept we've already covered in previous chapters. So this is what we're going to do in this chapter, to dimensional strain analysis. And I think uh, I will explain it gradually as we go along. So we move on to slide one. As I said, slide one was already covered in the problem solving session almost 10 days ago. However, I'll go through it again for the students who have not had time to look at the or watch the podcast or were not present in the problem solving session. On the slide at number one, we have a thin cylindrical shell which is subject to internal pressure, tension, bending, and torsion. And our objective is to find stresses at three points. Points one, two, and three. Now, I've attached alpha beta coordinate system to the cross section of the cylinder, and I have attached x y coordinate system for, to each of these elements. So I'm supposed to draw this uh, cross section on the right hand side based on the standard of the drawing. However, I've drawn it on the left hand side. So the Three points you see on this cylinder, one, two, and three, the front view of the cylinder, this, this is how the points are, can be shown. So as I said, I attach XY coordinate system as a local coordinate system of each of these elements, one, two, and three. Based on what you learn at the end of chapter one, if you've got a two-dimensional problem, we have at most three stress components, two normal and one shear. 
And because a shear stress is complementary, you can see that the shear stresses, we've got all over there, this tiny element. So this element here, this is actually a point where you see these uh, three dots. Similar to where the strain rosettes were when you were doing your experiments on. The strain rosette in your case was at about 200 millimeters from the left or clamped end of the tube. So if you've got a three, at most, a three stress components, so we are after three stress components when it is subject to a combination of loads. And we can analyze it using superposition rule, provided material has linear elastic behavior. So based on the superposition rule, we apply each of those loads individually. We find the stresses and the strains for each load applied, and then we superimpose the stress components for a combination of loads. As I said, I repeat, this is provided material has linear elastic behavior. So we are after these three stress components at these three points. I start with applying the force, which is axial, and at, at the moment it's a tensile force. So based on what you learn in chapter one, all the points, provided the force is uniformly distributed, all these points, not just one, two, three, any of the points on this cylinder experiences the same stress, and that is equal to F divided by the cross-sectional area. The cross-sectional area is this black area. So if the, the diameter is D, we can say, and the thickness is T, uniform thickness of T, we can say the cross-sectional area of the cylinder is pi times D, the diameter, times the thickness. So A in this case is not the enclosed area, it's the cross-sectional area. So in that case, we can say for any point on the cylinder, provided the force is uniformly distributed, the stress in the x-direction is equal to F divided by A, the cross-sectional area. So this is what we learned, you learned in chapter one. Now we move on to chapter two. When we cylinder, this thin walled a cylinder subject to internal pressure. So in that case, the cylinder experiences axial stress of a PD over 40 and hoop stress or circumferential stress of PD over 2T. Now Z, if you look at this element, X is in the same direction of Z axis of the cylinder. So we can say sigma X at this point is equal to PD over 40 because of the internal pressure. And y-axis is in the same direction of the circumferential direction of the cylinder. So y and theta are, are in the same direction. So therefore, because of the internal pressure, we have PD over 2T applied at any point on the cylinder, not, not necessarily these three points. Any points, because the pressure is uniformly distributed, experiences the hoop stress of PD over 2T. As I said, a theta and y are in the same directions. And axial stress of PD over 40. And because PD over 40 is in the same direction as F over A, so we can add up these two. So that is the internal pressure. Now we move on to chapter four. Chapter three was moments of area. Then we moved on to chapter four. In chapter four, the components were subject to tor a torsh, I mean, subject to torsion. So at the moment, this cylinder is subject to a torque, has a uniform thickness. So we can use the equation for TR over J for finding the shear stress distribution. All these uh, three points are located on the outer layer and any other points, because torque is uniformly distributed along the length, then we can say the shear stress is equal to TR over J. So R is the radius of the cylinder, T is the torque applied, and J is the polar second moment of area. For J, you can either use, because it is a thin, you can say it's 2 pi R cubed T, which is an approximate value, or you can say pi over 32 multiplied by fourth power of outer diameter minus four power of inner diameter. So that is chapter four. Now we move on to chapter five, 
when a component is subject to bending. At the moment, this bending moment is positive bending moment. The outer layer is, so, I mean, the top layer of the cylinder is subject to compression, and the bottom layer is subject to tension. So this is called a positive bending moment. And obviously, all the points on the neutral plane or neutral axis, which at the moment is a Z alpha plane, at the moment, Z alpha plane is a neutral plane. So any point on the neutral plane is subject to zero stress. So in that case, point one is subject to compression. Point two is located on the neutral plane, but point three is on the tension or tensile side. Now, if I'm supposed to design this cylinder, I need to find out which point is highly stressed. And then, based on what you're going to learn later in this chapter, based on the three failure criteria to say whether that stress in that position is principal stress, is for Mrs. stress, or Tresca, based on the Tresca criterion, is less or more than the yield stress. So first, the first stage is we find the position of the points, which is highly loaded. Now, if you look at this, obviously, you can see point three is highly loaded in comparison with point one. So all the points at the bottom of this cylinder are highly loaded in comparison with the rest of the component. So if I'm, allow, I'm asked to design this component, then I have to compare the principal stresses or for Mrs. stresses at these points with the yield stress. This is what you're going to learn. Don't worry if you don't understand what I'm saying at the moment. So this is the first stage. Finding the point of position on the structure which is highly loaded, which is at the moment a point a three. Now, are there any questions on the slide one? So as I said in previous chapters, the structures were just subject to one type of loading, but in majority of the structures, during the surface slide, they're subject to a combination of loads. So we move on to a slide number two. Now, slide number two is not examinable, but I added it because it gives you a better understanding of the next slide, which is a slide number three. Say this is a component which is loaded and it's in a static equilibrium. So at the moment, assume this is a three-dimensional problem. So X, Y, Z coordinate system is attached to the corner of a room or wherever this object is. And these are loads applied, and these are the constraints. We're looking at a point within this structure. When I, I draw it as a cube, but it's actually a point. So we have a close-up view of this point, or this cube, in the middle of a structure, which is loaded. So we attach X, Y, Z coordinate system to the corner of this cube. Now, based on the stress definition, each of these planes, of the, because it is highly loaded, non-linear, non-linear, whatever, every plane of this structure, of this cube, is subject to stresses. So if you look at this plane, you can see it's subject to two shear stresses and a normal stress. So I've shown the black arrows for shear and the red arrow for normal stress. Now, stress is usually, for a three-dimensional domain, shown by two subscripts. The first subscript shows the normal to the plane, the stress is acting, and the second subscript shows the stress direction. So in that case, X is normal to this plane, so all these three subscripts start with X. So you can see the first subscript of all these three components of the stresses, we have got X, as a first index, and then we have the second one showing the direction. And we have the same for the other plane. Again, in this one, Y is normal, so we have two shear and one normal, so we've got, in this case, it's sigma Y1, and then it is a two Y Z and two Y X. And the same as at the top. So at this point within this loaded component, we have three normal stresses. 
sigma xx, sigma y, y, and sigma zz. And we've got six shear stresses. Now, in majority of textbooks, they, for normal stress, they just use one index, one subscript. But in some books, um, they use both of them. And on the other hand, for rotational equilibrium, shear stress must be complementary. This is something you already know. So it means 2xy is equal to 2yx, 2xz, 2zx, and for the last one. So what does this tell us? It means at a point in a loaded component, we have nine stress components, but only six of them are independent. So at a point, we have six stress components. Well, what does this mean? It means the stress is not a vector quantity. So when I say temperature, temperature is a scalar quantity. If I say the temperature of this room is 20 degrees, you won't ask me any other question, just say that I've said 20 degrees. If I say I'm moving with the speed of 20, 50 miles per hour, the next question you ask me, which direction you are going, you're driving or you're moving? It means velocity is a vector quantity. Force is a vector quantity. So you need the value, the amount of the force, and its direction. But the stress is not a vector quantity, it's a tensor quantity, and we show it with a matrix. This is a, a few of you in your first course where I noticed you were treating your stress components like vectors, and you're using, say, the resultant is equal to a square root of this, a square of this, and a square of the other stress component, which is not correct. So stress is not a vector quantity is a tensor quantity or a matrix quantity, is a symmetric matrix. So this is a stress tense, a stress matrix. You can see all the normal components are located in the diagonal position and all the shear stress are located in the rest for or the rest of the terms of the matrix. Now if you look at this matrix at the moment, the first row and the first column belong to X. The first, so all the stresses here will fill up this row and this column. The second one, the second row and the second column belong to Y, and the third column and third row belong to Z axis. And stress and strain always treated the same, like brother and sister. They are both matrices. You can see we've got a very, a very similar structure for strain values. We've got all the normal strains in the diagonal positions, and we've got the other ones, the strain, the shear strains, in the, for the rest of them. So both the stresses and the strains are symmet can be shown by symmetric matrices. Neither of them is a vector. And if I've got a point within this structure, it moves to a new position, such as a prime, this we can't see with my naked eye, but we call it deformation. For example, in the fourth example of your laboratory assignment, you're finding U and V, the horizontal and vertical deflection at the tip of the beam. So you are after U and V. So in majority of textbooks, they use U, V, and W for the displaced components in the X, Y, and Z direction, respectively. So this is not examinable, but it helps you to understand the rest of the slides. Any questions on the slide two? So we move on to slide number three. So that was an exam question. The difference between plane stress and plane strain problems, or what is plane what are plane strain problems, stress problems, or what are plane strain problems. So as I said, in the previous slide, that stress and strain are symmetric matrices, and we've got at most six independent stress components at any point of a loaded component. And everything around us is three-dimensional, but sometimes we can analyze problems as two-dimensional problems. It's not because they are two-dimensional, because they mathematically can be analyzed as two-dimensional problems. For plane stress problems, the stress components in one direction are always equal to zero. 
If that direction is z axis, z direction, then we can say sigma z, you can see one, all of them, they share one index. So this is sigma z z, sigma z y, and sigma z x. But what, when does this occur? It's when the material is very, very thin, and we have no out of plane loading. So if you've got a thin flat plate subject to biaxial loading and also shear loading, it can be analyzed as a plane stress problem. And the reason is that because it is very thin, the stresses in the other direction are very, very small or negligible. So this is, this happened, plane stress problem, as I said, happens in thin members subject to in-plane loading. If we apply out of plane loading, then it's not a plane stress problem anymore. For plane strain problems, the strain in one direction is always equal to zero or negligible. So in that case, epsilon z, epsilon z y, and ep, uh, sorry, epsilon z, gamma z y, and gamma z x are approximately equal to zero. It happens when the structure in the third dimension is a z direction in comparison with the x and y directions is very, very large. So this is a very good example. Again, the strain in the third direction can be ignored, the strain values. So this is like a dam, a uniform dam forming a water reservoir. As you can see, the force is always uniformly distributed in the z direction. So if the force is not uniformly distributed along the z direction, again, this is not considered as a plane strain problem. So if you're analyzing the wing of an aircraft, it can be analyzed ignoring the weight of the engines. You can analyze it as a plane stream problem. And it, in majority of Texas, they do use a plane stream problem for an approximate solution. So again, you ignore it is tapered. You remove the weight of the engines. You can analyze it. An aerofoil can be analyzed, analyzed, can be analyzed as a plane stream problem. So either you are dealing with a plane stress problem or you are dealing with a plane stream problem at each point you have at most a three stress components. This is what we covered at the end of chapter one. Two normal and one shear. And because of rotational equilibrium, shear stress must be the same, complementary. So therefore, this is the stress matrix for a two-dimensional problem, plane stress or plane strain, and this is a strain matrix for a two-dimensional problem. Now, for plane strain problems, sigma z exists. We don't write it in the matrix, sigma z exists, but it's not an independent value. This is something you're going to deal with next year in your structures three. So are there any questions on the slide of three? So a summary, everything is three-dimensional, but mathematically, we can analyze some engineering problems. Actually, a lot of engineering problems can be analyzed as two-dimensional plane stress problems or plane stream problems. So for plane stress problems, the third dimension in comparison with the other two dimensions is a small, and we have no out of plane loading. Everything is in plane. For plane stream problems, the third dimension, in comparison with the other two dimensions, in plane dimensions, is very, very large. And the strain in the third dimension can be ignored. So in that case, we can analyze it as, as I said, plane strain. And this happens in members which are very long. The third dimension, in comparison with the other two, is large. Any question on the slide three? So this is something I covered in chapter one. If you had a thin flat plate subject to biaxial loading and shear loading, so you haven't got it because it is from a slide, tw a slide 22, chapter one. Based on superposition rule, we said we can say each of those loads, stress is applied individually. 
And then, for each case, we found the string components. So in this case, this is the strain in the x direction is sigma x over e, Young's modulus. In the lateral direction, we have contraction, which is minus nu sigma x over e. For the middle one, this, the force, the stress is applied in the y direction. So we have extension in the y direction, contraction in the lateral direction or x direction. And in the last one, it's just shear strain. But combining these two and combining these two, we found the constant equations for two-dimensional problems, planar stress problems. So what you see at the moment, please, if you don't, at the time I didn't say it's planar stress, but on the slide 22, the constant equations of planar stress problems. And if we have temperature variation, we also add it to the equations. So in this chapter, we don't deal with temperature. So alpha delta, both of them are equal to zero. And based on these uh, three constant equations for plane stress problems, I solved for you question 14 from chapter one. I'm just re refreshing your memory so for the future slides to be easier for you to understand. So we had a thin flat plate. <coughs> Say this is an element within a loaded component. We had the stress of 50 megapascal, 100 megapascal, and a shear stress of 30. So from there, you calcul we calculated the strain in the x direction, strain in the y direction, and the shear strain. So this is an example which, at the time, I had to cover these equations. We needed them for stress strain analysis of thin spherical shells and thin cylindrical shells when they were pressurized. So we move on to slide number four. So this is a two-dimensional strain matrix. As you can see, we've got two normal strains and one shear, which are the same. Gamma xy and gamma yx are the same. This is the stress matrix. So based on the equation I showed you earlier, we can write these three constant equations or stress to strain relations relating the strain components to stress components for pain and stress problems. We can also write stresses in terms of the strains. So on the right hand side of the slide four, you write, I'm writing stresses in terms of the strains. So I start with the bottom equation. So tau xy is equal to g gamma xy So stress in terms of the strains. And here, if I eliminate a sigma y between these two equations, I can write stress sigma x in terms of epsilon x and epsilon y. And if I eliminate a sigma x between these two, I can write sigma y in terms of the strain components. So these are the three equations at the moment you're using for your laboratory assignments. You've, I've given you in the required equations file. So when you do a strain analysis in the lab, we cannot measure stresses in the laboratory. We can measure strains. And once you get the strain measurements, then you find the stress components, the corresponding stress components. So at the moment, you're using these three equations to find the experimental stresses from measured strain values. So any question on this slide number four? Okay. So we move on to the next slide. Slide number five. Now, I, as I said earlier, stress is not a vector quantity. If you've got a vector quantity, you can resolve it in the XY coordinate system. And if your XY coordinate system is rotated 
and you have X prime, Y prime coordinate system, then again, you can easily resolve it in the new coordinate system. But stress is not a vector quantity. If you want to transform it from one coordinate system to another, we cannot treat it like the way we treat vectors. So say this is a point like the very first slide I showed you, like we had that thin wall cylinder, and we found that the point at the bottom, the point at the bottom of that cylinder, which was subject to internal pressure, bending, torsion, and axial loading, was highly loaded. So say it's that point, but it is at the moment in, in, in XY coordinate system. But if I want to design that cylinder, that XY coordinate system is not necessarily the coordinate system the maximum stresses are occurring. So we are interested to see at that position, which is the critical point, in which plane we have maximum stresses acting. So that's why we are transforming stress components from one coordinate system to another coordinate system. So in that case, I'm going to cut this element, which is actually a tiny point in a loaded component with a plane. And this is the plane whose normal mixed angle of a theta with the x-axis. So I'm cutting it with by a plane. So say this, the, this edge of this element is dl, dx and dy are the, size, the sizes in the x and y directions respectively, and these are the stresses acting on these two edges. So these two blue lines show the normal to this, this plane and the tangential direction of the plane. Say this is the result on the stress on this plane, the green arrow. If this is the result and the stress on this plane, I resolve it to two components. One, I call it the stress normal to the plane, Sn, and the other one, which is the tangential direction, I call it Ss. So the normal stress, Sn, and shear stress, Ss. In majority of textbooks, they use a sigma and S interchangeably for stress. And I use the same notation that majority of textbooks use, so SN and SS. <coughs> now the proof, I assume at the moment, the thickness or depth is equal to one. So you can assume it's delta Z. It doesn't make any difference. They're going to be eliminated from both sides of the equation. So our objective is to find a relations because we are after these two components. You're after these two components in terms of these three stress values, these, the stress matrix, the initial stress matrix. So this element is in equilibrium, static equilibrium. So if this length is equal to DL and the depth is equal to unit, therefore I can say the force is SN multiplied by DL. So our objective is writing the summation of the forces in the normal direction equal to zero, summation of the forces in the shear direction equal to zero, in order to find relations for SN and SS in terms of these three stress components. So SN multiplied by DL gives me the force multiplied by one, which I have or delta Z, gives me the force applied on this plane in the N direction. So the next stage is finding the resultant of these four force stresses, again in the normal direction. So sigma x multiplied by dy, as I said, depth is equal to one. And if you find the resultant, of the resolve it in the normal direction, it should be multiplied by cosine of theta. Then the next one is 2xy multiplied by dy, and then you need to resolve it to find it should be multiplied by sine of theta. I believe in your notes, these two are not correct. If you just correct it, please. And finally, and not finally, we have got sigma y multiplied by a dx, then multiplied by sine of theta, and 2xy multiplied by dx multiplied by cosine of theta. And this must be equal to zero. I believe in your notes, I 
it was a copy from an old notes which was not right so if you just please correct I don't know which one maybe I'm not correct but if you just um, look at your PDF file which you uploaded I believe one of them must be DX in, in your notes is DX instead of DY so if I do that and then here I can say dx is equal to dl sine of theta, dy is equal to dl cosine of theta, dl can be eliminated from both sides, so from there I can say the normal stress acting on this plane is equal to sigma x cosine square of theta plus sigma y sine square of theta plus 2 to xy sine theta cosine of theta. And since we have these two trigonometric relations, I can say Sn can be written in terms of these stress components using the angle theta. So this theta is the only variable in this equation. It means I can have numerous values for different planes passing through this point at different angles. I just repeat it for summation of the forces in the shear direction to be equal to zero. Again, SS multiplied by DL multiplied by 1 gives me the force applied in the shear direction here. And then I just resolve the other forces equating to 0. And then find a relation between SS and the stress components, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. Using these three trigonometric equations, I can find another equation. So in majority of textbooks, they use these two equations to find the normal stress and shear stress acting on any plane for a two-dimensional problem passing through a point. And theta is the angle of the normal to the plane with respect to the x-axis. So you can see the normal to this plane makes angle of a theta with the x-axis in the anticlockwise direction. So what you see on slide five, we call a stress transformation. As I said, we don't treat the stress components like vector components or stress values. Stress is a matrix, it's not a vector quantity. So in order to transform it from one coordinate system to another for two dimensional problems, plane stress or plane strain, we need to use these two equations. Sometimes people use these two, but these are the most popular ones. Then when we move on to Moore's diagram, it's much easier to use these two rather than these two equations. Any questions on the slide five? Okay. So let's solve No, no, sorry, no, sorry. So this is a, the, this is a, a typical element with three stress components, plane stress or plane strain. And based on the equations I showed you earlier, we can find the normal stress and shear stress acting on any plane passing through this point whose normal makes angle of theta with the x-axis. Now, Actually, this point, which I've drawn it as a square, is a point within a structure. So it, it looks as if I've rotated this point for the angle of theta. So imagine this is this point here. So this square has been rotated for the angle of theta. And this is what we've done. We found the normal stress acting in, on this plane, and we found the shear stress acting on this plane. And the shear stress is complementary. We have the same shear stresses on these two. So you should ask, what about these two planes? Because we said the stress is a matrix. So we should have also three stress components here. Now, if I cut this plane, this element, at an angle of theta in this direction, which is normal to the first one, then I can find very similar to what I did, I can find this stress component here, or the stress is acting on these two planes. 
Now, if you just look at this one, this is theta, and it is a theta plus 90 degrees. It means it's a 2 theta plus 180 degrees. It means if I just change the signs, these two plus to minus, on the trigonometric circle, when we have got theta plus 90, or 2 theta plus 180 degrees, the cosines and sines becomes a negative. So therefore, you just need a two multiply them by a minus. So if you compare these two, you just have minus here instead of plus. So here we've got the stress matrix of sigma x with the components of sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. Here we've got Sn, S theta as the two normal stresses, and Sn theta, or Ss, is the shear stress component in this coordinate system. So I've transformed or from stress components from one coordinate system to another using these three equations. In your examination data sheets, I only gave you these two. So if I asked you an exam, I would usually ask these two values. Any questions on the slide number 5B? So we move on to solving the first part of question three. Now, I'm going through different slides. Each one has got a series of equations. If you understand the concept, analyzing the problem, it takes only five minutes. So the concept is, if you understand it fully, application is a straightforward. It's much easier than previous chapters we had so far. So we have here, in I'm going to gradually solving different parts of question three. You've got an element selected by inspection, selected from a, a component which is subject to com, combine, combine loading. The case is plain stress. It's subject to a normal stress of 100 megapascal in the x direction, a normal stress of 50 megapascal in the y direction, and a shear stress of 75 megapascals. So the problem is asking us uh, to find uh, the normal stress, normal and shear stresses acting on a plane whose normal mixed angle of 60 degrees with the x-axis. Another way of saying it is like this element is rotated for 60 degrees. Either I say the normal mixed angle of 60 with the x-axis in the anticlockwise direction, or if you want to imagine it, this little point with a loaded structure is rotated for 60 degrees. So our objective is to find S and an S at theta. So these are the two equations. So sigma x is equal to 100. Sigma y is equal to 50, and shear stress is 75. Theta is equal to 60 degrees, so cosine of 2 theta is cosine of 120 degrees, sine of 120 degrees. I substitute the values. So the normal stress acting on this plane is 127.45 megapascals. The shear stress, I find it from this equation. So here we've got sigma x again, sigma y, shear stress. So the shear stress is 59.15 megapascals. I've also on this slide found for you S theta, the normal stress acting on this plane. So as I said, if in this equation I just write it minus, and we find S theta. So if I was going to compare the yield stress of the material with the maximum stress here, which is 100, then it wouldn't be right. Because as you can see, in a plane at angle of 60 degrees, the normal stress is 127, which is more than 100. So therefore, what we have to do, we need 
to orient these elements at an angle which we reach the maximum normal stress, then we, we can compare it with the yield stress of the material. So this is our main purpose. So we oriented at an angle where the maximum stress, maximum normal stress occurs, then we can say, all right, if this is less than the yield stress of the material, the component is safe. So this is the stress matrix here. We've got 100, 50, 75, and this is the stress matrix at an angle of 60 degrees. Any question on question number, the first part of question three? So we move on to the next slide. Slide number six, principal stresses. So as I said, using this equation here, you can find the normal stress acting on any plane passing through this point with the angle of theta. So it means if I change a theta between zero and 180 degrees, I end up with numerous values of four cent. But there must be a plane or planes where the only subject to normal stress or normal stresses and the shear stress is equal to zero. So if I keep rotating this element, I will reach to a point where the only stress acting on the plane is normal and its shear stress is zero. That plane is called principal plane. The stress acting on it is called principal stress and the normal to it is called principal direction. So a plane passing through a point which is only subject to normal stress or normal, normal stress and the shear stress is equal to zero is called a principal plane. So that was an exam question. What are principal planes? Or what are principal stresses? So we are after a plane which is only subject to normal stress, and its stress is maximum. Now, in this equation here, Sn is a function of theta for a particular value or a particular value of a matrix value, I mean components. Sigma x, tau xy, and sigma y are constant. So therefore, normal stress is just a function of theta. And we are after Sn which has the maximum value, maximum normal stress. And this is a function of theta. If you are after maximum value of a function with one variable, what, would, what do we do? We just find its derivative with respect to that variable and equate it to zero. So in this case, the derivative of a cosine of two theta this is a constant value. The derivative of this term with respect to theta is zero. The derivative of this term with respect to theta is equal to two sine of two theta with the negative sign. And the derivative of this term is two cosine of two theta. As I said, these are constant values when theta is a variable. So this is the derivative. This is zero. This is the derivative of this term. This is the derivative of this term. I equate it to zero. So therefore, I find the tangent of two theta n, the plane of the principal plane, using this relation, equal to two tau x y divided by sigma x minus sigma y. But you agree on the trigonometric circle. You've got two angles which have the same tangent. So I found the orientation of the principal plane. It means the tangent of the, the two times theta in that angle is equal to this term. And on trigonometric circle, as I said, we've got two planes or two angles which have the same tangent. If you know that if tangent of two theta, two theta n and two theta n plus 180 degrees have the same tangent. So two theta n and two theta n plus 180 degrees have the same tangent. It means we have two planes or which have this, these, uh, theta, the angle of theta n. One is the same tangent. 
theta n, as I said, 2 theta n plus 2 theta n plus 180 degrees, or theta n plus theta n plus minus degrees gives us the orientation or orientations of the principal planes. So I have the orientation of the two planes. Tangent of 2 theta n is equal to this term. If I've got tangent of an angle, I can find its sine of sine and its cosine. If I do that, so if I find sine using this equation, I find sine of 2 theta n and cosine of 2 theta n. And substituting the top equation, I find a two stress values. Which we call them a principal stresses. Obviously, one of them is bigger than the other one. We call it maximum principal stress. So I repeat, at any point in a loaded structures for a two-dimensional plane stress or plane strain problem, we have a two planes which are only subject to normal stresses. They are called principal planes. Their directions are called principal directions. The stresses applied to them are called principal stresses. One of them is bigger than the other one. We call it maximum principal stress. And based on what I showed you, these two are orthogonal. It means the two principal planes are normal to each other because 2 theta n and 2 theta n plus 180 degrees have the same tangent. Therefore, the two planes must be orthogonal at any point. But one of them is subject to maximum normal stress. We call it maximum principal stress. So the equations for the maximum and principal stresses are these two. And the question usually a student asks, does the negative sign give us the minimum principal stress? And the answer is no. Sometimes the plus one gives you the minimum, sometimes the negative one gives you minimum. How did you find these two equations? By well, just substituting sine of 2 theta n and cosine of 2 theta n in the top equation, and from there I find this equation. You can do it in your own time. It's not examinable. So any question on slide 6? Yes, please. Um, so for the maximum and the minimum principal stress, so it depends on the magnitude. Could you say it a bit louder, please? So for the maximum and minimum principal stresses, does it depend on the magnitude or? Sigma y, it depends on your stress matrix, sigma x, sigma y, and 2xy. So you start, you, as I said, you buy inspection, you find within a loaded component, you find the stress matrix. Now, in that coordinate system, you're not 100% sure whether the normal stress is maximum or not. So what you do, you change the orientation of the plane you're working in, or the coordinate system you're working in. Now, using these two equations and this orientation, you can find the position at that location in, in that point that you found by inspection. In which orientation? Of which plane the maximum normal stress occur? Does it answer the question? Yes? Okay. Any other questions? So it's 10.53, so could you come back here at 7 minutes, so 11, 3 past 11, please? Okay, 10 minutes. Thank you. I was going to ask, with the example, you used 120 degrees, was that because yeah, it said 60 degrees anti-clockwise? So yes. you used to use 120 and then use like clockwise equations. Could you have changed the sign and use 60? Or... I, can, can we go down? <laughs> Everything we say gets recorded, it's just okay. come on. <laughs> As in, uh, so obviously it said 60 degrees anti-clockwise. Yes. So you used 120 degrees. No, the thing is... Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. This is a plane. I'm rotating the normal to the plane, not the plane itself. The normal to the plane makes angle of 60 degrees with the x-axis in the anticlockwise direction. Not the plane. So, normal to the plane. So the equations you found were like, in terms of like, clockwise rotation? 
Yes. So you just had to find a different yes. in hundred and eighty. Anti clockwise rotation. Okay. Yes. Mm. Okay. Could you use sixty degrees and like change the size or like change the convention? What do you mean change? So as in like you, for the equations you found was like this, this direction of rotation. So could you have found equations for like the other direction of rotation? Yeah, of course you can. Like changing the signs of the Yes, but well, this is how that usually people yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. The standard. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, my question is about. I don't really understand. I, I, I mean, this is this equation. I think the way I've written it here is not correct. Um, which one? I think it should be correct. Do you is write it correct? Right? Okay, so I'm okay. So the one I have is correct. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't really understand what a theta means. Yes, theta is a normal stress like sigma y in this coordinate means, system. In this, uh, in this surface. It does, doesn't exist here. In this direction. No, 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 no. You don't see it here. Ah. You don't see a theta here. As I said, if you just you need to cut it like this to find a theta. Okay, so. So in order to find a theta. Yeah. It, say you didn't want this end, you wanted these two. Yeah. What you have to do, you have to cut it this way and you write equilibrium equations for this plane to get this theta. It's, you don't see a theta here. Is this such a screen? So, a theta is in this direction, which is normal to this surface, right? Yes, yes. So this is a normal to this one, to this plane. Ah, so the negative sign here is coming from 90 degree minus 2 theta. So what what I told you, <laughs> yeah. if you just start, say if you start from here, yeah. you end up with these two equations. What you could do, you could just say 2 theta plus um, 180 degrees because this is 90 degrees. It's 2 theta plus 180 degrees. So it means you just say me on the trigonometric circle. If this is the angle here, if you go 180, both sine and cosine become negative. Ah, yeah. Yeah? Makes sense. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah? Happy? Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I'm not very clear. What does it mean by push push to the spot baby if we don't find it? If, what does it mean? Uh, yeah. What does it mean by principles as principal plane? It means, okay, is it true that I understand it? The principal plane is the plane where the normal stress is maximum? Is it yes, that's right. No, the thing is, if you have got a function of a variable, when can you find the maximum value in terms of that variable? You need to find the derivative equated to you equate it to, the, to you because you're after the maximum normal stress. Is that correct? Okay. You want the maximum normal stress, okay? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Just.
I showed you that for a three-dimensional problem, we have at most six stress components, three normal and three shear. Some engineering, a lot of engineering examples can be analyzed as two-dimensional plane stress or plane stream problems. And for these cases, we have the stress matrix or stress, uh, the strain matrix, both of them, they have uh, three independent components, two normal and one shear. I showed you that stress is not a vector quantity, it's a tensor or matrix quantity. And in order to transform them from one coordinate system to another, we cannot treat them like vectors. So I showed you two equations, which this is one of them, how to find the normal stress and shear stress acting on any plane passing through a point in a two-dimensional problem. So theta is the angle that the normal to that plane you're interested in makes with the X direction in the anti-clockwise. And principal stresses, obviously using those two equations, you can find numerous values for stresses or normal stress and shear stress acting on a plane whose normal makes angle of theta with the X axis. But there must be a plane passing through that point who which is just subject to normal stress, and the value of the normal stress is maximum. That a plane is called a principal plane, and the value, the stress is called principal stress. The direction is called principal direction. I showed you how mathematically we can find the direction of the principal plane, but one of the students said, what, why we have got two planes? And the answer is because when we are after the principal direction, we find the derivative of this equation with respect to theta equated to zero, and because two angles on the trigonometric circle have the same tangent, therefore we are after the plane of the maximum principal stress, we also find another plane which, has, which is only subject to normal stress. That plane is also called a principal plane, what is called plane of minimum principal plane or principal stress. And these are the two equations for finding the minimum and maximum principal stresses. And in order to find them, we find the tangent and, uh, and uh, using this tangent, we find the sine of the angle, cosine of the angle, substitute the top equation to find these two values. Now we move on to next part of question number three. The next part, we found, we found the first part. The next part is asking us to find the maximum principal stress and its direction. So from there, we have two equations to find principal stresses. So I've separated them as two different equations. As I said earlier, the plus sign not always gives us the maximum principal stress. Sometimes it gives us the minimum principal stress. So the two equations for finding the maximum and minimum principal stresses, I substitute the values. So we've got 100, 50, 150, the shear stress 75, and from there we can find sigma one the maximum principal stress, which is 150 megapascals, and the minimum, which is minus 4 megapascals. So if I'm expected to design this component, then it's better to compare 154 with the yield stress of the material. As you can see in the XY coordinate system, the maximum stress is 100. In this coordinate system, sigma 1 is 154. So if I was asked to find the direction of that, plane or the directions of the planes, I use this equation. So theta n is equal to 36 degrees. So 36 plus 90 gives us the, the other plane because the two are orthogonal. So look at this element now. It has no shear stresses acting on it. It's just purely subject to normal stresses. One is 154 and the other one is minus 4. 
And this is, obviously, it's normal, makes angular 36 degrees with the x-axis. One of the students asked me, are we rotating the plane? We're rotating the normal to the plane. Is this the question you asked me, yes? So I'm rotating normal. So can you see the normal to the plane makes angular 36 degrees? So any question in regard to this part of question number three? So the next stage finding the maximum shear stresses. So we found principal stresses, which were purely normal. We also, after a plane, where which is subject to maximum shear stress, because there are some components in engineering purely subject to shear stresses. So in that case, we need to find the maximum shear stress, and then in the trust criterion that you learn later on, to compare it with the yield stress of the material. If a component is mostly subject to normal stresses, then we need to go after maximum principal stress. Now, maximum shear stresses, which we showed them to using a 2-1, the symbols 2-1 and 2-2. Two two. So the principal stresses, we use sigma 1 and sigma 2. In some books, they use S1 and S2. As I said, S and sigma are usually used interchangeably. So if you're after a plane which is subject to maximum shear stress, well, the difference between plane of maximum shear stresses and principal planes is that the plane of maximum shear stresses could be subject to normal stress or normal stresses. But the value is definitely less than the maximum principal stress. So we are rotating the plane in a way that it is subject to maximum shear stress. So we are after that value. And that is the equation for finding shear stress on any plane whose normal mechanical of theta with the x-axis in the anti-clockwise direction. Again, sigma x, sigma y, 2x, y are constant values. Theta is a variable, and we are after the maximum SS. Again, SS is the function of theta. If I'm after the maximum of a function, when only one variable exists, I find the derivative of that function with respect to theta equated to zero. So in that case, the derivative of sine of two theta is equal to two cosine of two theta, derivative of cosine of two theta is minus two sine of two theta. It gives, it gives me this equation. So the derivative of the top equation with respect to theta equal, equal to zero. So it gives me the tangent of two theta s, where theta is, is the plane of the maximum shear stress, is equal to minus sigma x minus sigma y divided by two to xi. If I've got a tangent of an angle, I can find the sine and cosine and then find it, uh, substitute in the top equation, and find the maximum and minimum shear stresses acting in that position. So as I said, similar to principal stresses, we have two angles on the trigonometric circle which have the same tangent. So two theta s plus two theta s plus, hun, plus 180 degrees, they have the same tangent. It means theta s, and theta s plus 90 degrees must be the planes of maximum shear stresses. So theta s and theta s plus 90, they are orthogonal planes. Obviously, theta s plus theta, there are two angles, the two planes which, the difference between the angles is 90. It means they, are, they must be perpendicular or orthogonal. So if I find if I've got the tangent of an angle, I can find its sine and cosine. I substitute in the top equation and it gives me the minimum maximum shear stresses occurring at this position. As I said earlier, the plane the maximum shear stresses, they could be subject to normal stresses, but definitely the normal stress in them is less than the maximum principal stress. Now, if you compare this equation, these two equations, with the two principal stresses we had. So these two equations give us the maximum and minimum principal stresses. These two equations give us the maximum and minimum shear stresses. 
Now, if you compare these two equations, we can say 2, 1, and 2, 2 are equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 2 divided by 2. So some of the students prefer, once they solve these two, find them, they just find the difference between the two and divide it by the two, or use these two equations. Majority use just for once you have sigma 1 and sigma 2, you can find the difference divided by two. In your choice. Now, tangent of 2 theta n was equal to 2 to x y divided by sigma x minus sigma y. And this is the equation for tangent of 2 thetas. You can see that tangent of 2 thetas multiplied by tangent of 2 theta n is equal to minus 1. It means 2 theta n and 2 theta s must be at 90 degrees, or theta n and theta s are at 45 degrees. It means the planes of maximum and minimum shear stresses bisect the angle or the angles between the principal planes. So if these two are principal planes, the white ones, say these two are principal planes, and these two are maximum, planes of maximum shear stresses, as you can see, this plane bisects the angle between these two. It means if I've got the principal plane, if I rotate it for 45 degrees, I reach to the plane of maximum shear stress, the same as the other two. So the plane, the planes of maximum and minimum shear stresses bisect the angle between the principal planes, or at 45 degrees to the principal planes. I think that's a better way of saying it. So this is what we've done. By inspection, we find uh, the position in a loaded component, which is highly, I mean, is the worst case scenario for it. So we've got a component, which is subject to a combination of loads. By inspection, we find the point which is highly stressed. Using the equations I showed you, we can find the stresses on any plane passing through that point. For that position, in that position, we, we can find maximum and minimum normal principal stresses. The maximum principal stress is the maximum normal stress occurring in that location. Using these two equations, we can find the maximum and minimum shear stresses. So we can find the maximum shear stress occurring in that location, actually on a different plane. So we move on to the next part of question number three. So the next part is asking us to find the maximum shear stress and its direction. Actually, this is not a solution for it. Sorry, I haven't got the solution for it for you. But I can solve it myself, why not? So in this case, we've got sigma x. Could you help me to do it? Sigma x is equal to um, sigma x is equal to 100. Sigma y is equal to 50. So if I want to find uh, the okay, why not using this one? So we've got the difference between these two is 154 minus minus 4 divided by 2 gives us the maximum uh, and minimum shear stresses. And if I rotate it at 45 degrees, it's 36 plus 45 gives me the, so the answer to that question is, so in this case, we've got the maximum shear stress is a 2-1, and 2, 2, 
is equal to plus minus 154, which is sigma 1, minus minus 4, which is sigma 2, divided by 2. It gives me 2, 1, and 2, 2. And it also asks us the direction theta s, I can say, is equal to theta n plus 45 degrees. So this was 36 degrees. Plus 45 gives me the direction of the theta s. I will give you the solution next time I see it. So this is the maximum principal stress. This is the minimum principal stress. If I add these two equations, I can say that sigma 1 plus sigma 2 is equal to sigma x plus sigma y. Say if I ever started from a different coordinate system, say if I ever started from x prime y prime coordinate system, in that case I could say sigma 1 plus sigma 2 is equal to sigma x prime plus sigma y prime. It means the summation of the normal stresses at the loaded at the position is always a constant value. It means the principal stresses do not depend on the coordinate system selected. It just, they just depend on the loads applied. So it doesn't matter which coordinate system you choose, you always end up with the same principal stresses. Obviously, these change, but because the summation is a constant value, it means principal stresses are independent of the selected coordinate system in your analysis. Any question on slide eight? Okay. So we move on to the next slide. Question number four. In question number four, we have a closed-ended circular cylindrical tube of diameter 250 millimeters and wall a thickness of five millimeters. A subject on internal pressure of three megapascals and a torque of about 15 kilonewton meters. <coughs> the problem is asking us to find the normal and shearing stress components acting on the, in the wall of the shell on a plane whose normal makes angle of 40 degrees with respect to the X, the main axis of the cylinder. Then the principal and maximum shearing stresses, we haven't covered this part yet, so we just can do parts one and two. Yes? No, I haven't covered it. It's the very last slide of this chapter. Okay, so we just covered, I'm going to solve the first part and the second part of this question for you. So we've got a thin walled cylinder and it's subject to a pressure of three megapascals and a torque of at 15 kilonewton meters. So I'm going to use the superposition rule. I apply each of those loads individually and then then superimpose stress or strain components. So subject to internal pressure. We have got an axial stress of PD over 40. The pressure inside is three megapascals. The diameter, 250 millimeters, assuming this is the mean diameter. The thickness is five. It gives us the axial stress of 37.5 megapascals. Now Z is along the axis. I've attached capital X, capital Y to the cross section and little x, little y to each of these elements. So therefore, I can say sigma x and sigma z are identical. So the stress acting in the x direction at, for all these three elements is 37.5 megapascals. This must be twice the other one. It's a closed-ended cylinder. So this is 37.5. It makes 
75 megapascals. So this is circumferential direction, it's tangent, and it's exactly the same as y-axis for each element. For the torsion, we've got a shear stress of TR over J. You can use T equal to 2AQ, but this is just a uniform, a thin walled tube. For J, you can either use pi over 32, fourth power of outer diameter minus four power of inner diameter, or an approximate solution of two pi r cubed T. So shear stress is equal to T r over J. R is equal to 150 J, whatever value you get from the T, 15 kilonewton meters. So therefore, these are the stress components for us. So which one of these is a 37.5? If you know the answer, is this one 37.5 or this one 37.5? Can you raise your hand, please? Which one is 37.5? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, that's good. So this is 37.5, this is 75, and this is 30.55. So we have found the stress components. Now the next stage is to find the stresses on a plane whose no one makes angle of 40 degrees with the Z axis. And Z and X for each element are collinear. So I'm going to use the equations I just found. So sigma x, 37.5, 75, and 30.55. Now my advice uh, to you in exam is that, please, if you're getting here, say, minus 75 megapascal, pascals, don't keep it at minus in this equation. Do not change the sign to positive. So you, here, the equations, the signs are hidden in each term. So if you've got 30, say minus 75 compression, you enter here minus 75, so multiply by minus becomes positive. So the signs are all hidden. So I substitute the values. So 37.5, 75, theta is 42, theta becomes 80 degrees. So from there you find Sn, which is 83 megapascals, and SS, which is minus 23.77 megapascals. Any questions? Okay, could you find yourself principal stresses, please? Sigma 1 and sigma 2. Sigma 1 and sigma 2, they're equal to sigma x plus sigma y divided by 2 plus minus 1 over 2 square root of whatever I showed you earlier. Yes, please. I think I wrote it earlier, they're, in, uh, they're interchangeable. In, I, I use both of them here. Um, they're the same. Cap I should say the answer is the same. Capital and this one. Could you find sigma 1 and sigma 2, please?
Yes, please. No, no, don't give me the answer. No, no, no. <laughs> have you all finished it? How many of you have found sigma 1 and sigma 2? Have you found it? Have you found it? Sigma 1, you need to find a tangent of 2 theta n equal to 2 tau xy divided by sigma x minus sigma y to find the direction. Could you say it louder, please? What does what represent? Sigma 1 and sigma 2 are principal stresses. So at this moment, at the moment, I mean, for this structure, these are the stress values in the x and y coordinate system. Using these two equations, we found the s, the normal and shear stresses in a different coordinate system. And it is rotated at angle of 40 degrees. Now, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are planes only subject to normal stresses passing through this point and the orientation, you can find it using the equation tangent of 2 theta n equal to 2 x y divided by sigma x minus sigma y. So we are, all these calculations are at particular points. So this is first you start with x y coordinate system. Then I rotate it for 40 degrees. So I rotated the, this element for 40 degrees. Now I find these two stress components. You can also find S theta if you want. Now, at this point again, there, are, there is a coordinate system. We call it a 1, 2 coordinate. In majority of textbooks, they call it 1, 2 coordinate system. They're called a principal planes. So we are still working in this point. We're just rotating it so that in 1, 2 plane or 1, 2 coordinate system, the component or the planes are just subject to normal stresses. We call them principal stresses. Does it answer the question? So just rotating the plane at a particular position, we would keep rotating it. So this is 40 degrees. Has anyone found a principal stresses? Yes? Okay. So here I substitute the values, and we find the maximum and minimum principal stresses. So you can see 92.1 is definitely bigger than 37.5. And then the direction is 2 theta n is minus 58, so theta n is minus 29 degrees. So could you find the maximum and minimum shear stresses, please? So the maximum and minimum shear stresses are equal to this term. So this is 1 over 2. So you can either use this equation, or you can find the difference between 2 and divide it by the 2. Now, could you tell me what theta s is equal to? If I just look at this value, theta n, what, can I just find theta s on this diagram? What is theta s? The plane of maximum shear stress bisects the angle between, or it's located at 45 degrees to the principal plane. So if it is minus 29, if I rotate it for 45 degrees, I can find uh, the direction of the maximum, plane of maximum shear stress. So this is 3585 megapascals. And that's exactly equal to 92.1 minus 20.4 divided by 2 plus minus. You can either use this equation or find the difference between these two plus minus, divided by 2 plus minus. And tangent of 2 theta s, you can either use this equation 
you can see it is equal to minus sigma x minus sigma y divided by 2, 2 x because the product of these two equal to minus 1, equal to 32 degrees. So if I rotate this for 45 degrees, I reach theta s. So minus 29 plus 45 gives me this angle here. Oh, sorry, 16 degrees. My approach. So these two gives this a 45 degrees. Any question on this slide four? On example four. So this is uh, a, a bit similar to what you're doing for the last question of your laboratory assignment um, sheets except that at the moment I'm going further. So you find the position of where the maximum stress is occurring. And this is the stage after that. Once you find it, then you just need to find the principal stresses, maximum shear stresses, for misses stress, and so on. So I'm not going to cover the other parts. I think it's a bit hard for you to understand it. Um, so what I do, I solve a couple of examples. Actually, you are going to solve them. Any question on this slide? Now, in question seven, we've got a series of components which are either subject to one type of loading or a combination of loads. The problem is asking us to find the stress components and the strain components at different locations. So the first one is we've got a beam which is subject to axial loading. The cross-sectional area is A. The points we have one is located at the top and one is located at the bottom of the beam. And the problem is asking us to find the stress components at these two locations. So could you tell me, could you think about it, what the three stress components are for point one and two? Sigma x, sigma y, and tau x y. Could you write it down, please? So at the moment, example one, the first part of question seven, um, seven I, we are in chapter one. We've got a bar or beam which is subject to tension. The cross-sectional area is A. What is the stress applied at each point of this bar? Any answers? Yes, please. Just F over A. Excellent. It's F over A. What is sigma y equal to? Zero. Do we have any force applied in the y direction? No. What about shear stress? Do we have any shear stress applied? No. So in this case, if I was asked to solve this problem, this is how I do it. So sigma x, there is no sigma y, so sigma x is equal to f of a. So if I was asked, I would say sigma x is equal to f of a. And sigma y 
and tau xy are equal to zero. So what is epsilon x equal to? Assuming Young's modulus is E and Poisson ratio is nu. What is epsilon x equal to? So I found a distress matrix. Now I'm going, I'm after a strain matrix, epsilon x. What is epsilon x equal to if the Poisson ratio a Young's modulus is E, Poisson ratio is. So do you agree it's equal to sigma X over E? What is epsilon Y equal to? Any answers? Epsilon Y? Poisson ratio is minus, is nu. Very good. Minus nu, sigma X over E. What about gamma xy? Because we have a strain is a matrix as well. What is gamma xy? Zero. Do we have any shear stress? No, so there is no shear strain. So the stress matrix is just, so we've got f of a, Zero, zero, and zero. Do you agree with me? Now the strain matrix. We have sigma x over e, f over a e. This is zero, this is zero, and this is minus nu f over e. So this is the stress matrix, and this is the strain matrix. Could you do the bottom one, please? The one which is the compression. What's the difference between bottom one and the top one? What, should, what is the difference between the two? Yes, please? Very good. So whatever we have on the top, we've got it at the bottom with the sign a negative. Yes, opposite sign. So it means this is, we've got, if I want to change it to the bottom one, for the bottom one, say this is, I use negative sign, so it becomes negative. So this is, the sign is hidden inside this. This is hidden. So everything becomes negative, so minus, minus, minus. Okay, any questions on this one? So I found the stress components and the strain components. Stress matrix and the strain matrix, both of them are the same, except this is the compression, this is tension. Right, could you do this one for me, please? The second one. We want to chapter two. Could you find the stress and the strain components for these two? You definitely get one question in the exam for combined loading case, at least. So one of the cases could be one of in your exam. So what shall we do for elements one and two of a pressure vessel which is pressurized? I mean, there's a thin walled cylinder which is pressurized. Could you write down this, the three stress components and the three strain components for each of these two? What do we have for point one? Point one? I just saw one example for you. Question number four. Any more? What is sigma x equal to for this pressure vessel? Pressure P diameter D thickness T. What is sigma x equal to?
Sigma x? PD over 2t or PD over 4t? 40, very good. So sigma x is equal to PD over 40. If I go to on the visualizer, I'm afraid it might not be recorded. So what about sigma y? What shall we do for with sigma y? What is sigma y equal to? P D over 60, 80, 2t, 2t. Sigma y is equal to P D over 2t. What about a shear stress here? In, a, in X uh, Y coordinate system or Z a theta coordinate system in chapter two, did we have any shear stress acting? Answer? Is there any shear stress? Why don't you answer? It's zero. So shear stress is zero. So this is the stress matrix. So the stress matrix, we have PD over 40. There is no shear stress. And then we have sigma Y, which is PD over So, what about point two? Are we in the same position or not? Point two and one, are they the same or different? The same. Good. Point two and one are the same. So, what about a strain components? We've got epsilon x. What is epsilon x equal to? Assuming this is a plane stress problem. Conceive equations, slide number four, please. We've got one over E, sigma X minus nu sigma Y. And epsilon Y is one over E, Sigma y minus sigma a nu sigma x. So sigma x is equal to PD over 40. Sigma y equal to PD over 2t. And gamma xy is equal to 0. So the strain matrix, we have zero here, we have zero here, we've got epsilon x, and we've got epsilon y. Okay, we do the rest of them is uh, 13 minutes to 12. We do the rest of them um, during the problem solving session. And Moore's diagram, failure criteria, and the strain analysis left, we shall go through them next week. And the last week, I just do revision. I go through different chapters, answer your questions, and solve some examples from past papers. And I believe one of you contacted me, uh, said that he's organizing uh, some revision sessions uh, during the January exams. He hasn't come back to me for the dates, so I'll let you know. Thank you very much, and have a nice time until Friday.